Well, good evening, everyone. Are you are you ready like I am? I hope you're doing better than I am. Yeah. All right. Well, it's good to see all of you. And I want to uh, thank everyone that helped today. Um, we couldn't do it with just one person, unless pastor's here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, thank you for your help. Uh, there's been several that's has helped out, and thank you, Sarah, for playing the piano. Thank you, choir, for singing, um, not bailing. Uh, we appreciate that. Um, and, of course, you're doing it for the Lord, okay? And that's why all of you are here tonight is for the Lord. So if you take your Bibles with me and open them to the New Testament, New Testament, let's try Old Testament book of Ruth, <clears throat> Ruth chapter 1. Is this thing on? Good. Ruth chapter 1. I had a cold a few weeks ago. I'm still fighting it. Fighting something. Ruth chapter 1. And we'll begin reading in verse number 1. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Emelech, and the name of the wife was Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of the Bethlehem, Judah, and they came into the country of Moab and continued there. And Amalek, <clears throat> Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. And they took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other was Ruth. And they dwelled there about ten years. And Malon and Chilion died, both, also both of them, and the woman was left of her two sons and her husband. And she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Wherefore she went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they dwelt, and they went, I'm sorry, on the way to return unto the land of Judah. And Naomi said unto her uh, two daughters-in-law, Go, return each to her mother's house, and the Lord deal kindly with you, as ye have dealt uh, with the dead and with me. And the Lord grant you <clears throat> that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband, then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. And they said unto her, Surely we will return with thee unto thy people. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there yet any more sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Turn again, my daughters. Go your way, for I am too old to have an husband. If I should say I have hope, if I should have a husband also tonight, and should also bear sons, would you tarry for them till they were grown? Would you stay for them <clears throat> from having husbands? Nay, my daughters, for it grieveth me much for your sakes that the hand of the Lord is gone out against me. And they lifted up their voice, and they wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth claved unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and to her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. For whether thou goest, I will go. And where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and my God, and thy God, my God. Where thou diest, I will die, 
and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. And which and when she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. Let's pray. Dear Father, we we ask this evening that you would bless this service. And Lord, I I feel as though you already have. For God, the true blessing is you being here. And Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts, that you would do something that would last for eternity here tonight, that you would help us, God, to see clearly what you would have us do. Lord, I pray that we would not only hear with our ears, but Lord, we would be obedient as well. God, we, we love you, and we thank you for this opportunity to come and to be in your house. Help us to never take that for granted. Thank you for the great salvation that you have given us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And God, help us to be like this young lady, Ruth, to be steadfastly minded. And we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a lot that is said around here about the Word of God in, in which it should be, because that's our rule of faith and practice. And you have to know the Bible. You have to know what God has said in order to be what Ruth is talking about here tonight. Um. One of the things that we need to realize is, is that this book of Ruth was um, during the time of the first half of the book of Judges. And if you look across the page at verse number 25 of the last chapter of Judges, it gives you an idea of what was going on. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. <clears throat> And then if you'll flip on back with me just for a moment to the beginning of Judges so that we can get a full understanding of exactly what was happening. Of course, we, we find uh, even before we get to Judges, uh, at the latter part of uh, Joshua, uh, Joshua gave the, the people a charge and um, he said, let me see, get to the right verse. He says in verse 19, Joshua said unto the people, You cannot serve the Lord, for he is, whole, he is a holy God. He is a jealous God, and he will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If you forsake the Lord and, for, and serve strange gods... Then he, uh, he will turn and do you hurt and consume you. After that, uh, he hath done you good. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you, the Lord, and to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now, that was the obvious choice, right? A lot of people say things they don't mean. Have you ever done that? You just say something. You go along with the crowd. Uh, someone we were, I think it was mentioned in Sunday school this morning, uh, one of the ways to, to be an encouragement to the pastor is to say amen. And I believe that's true. But don't you say amen unless you mean it. Amen. And know why you're saying it. I remember at Temple one day, Pastor Sexton was preaching, and we had one individual, he was, I mean, he was obnoxious in a way, but after I got away from there, I wish that he was with me, because man, that, that young man loved Christ, 
But anyway, what I'm talking about is he would just say amen all the time. He didn't even listen to what was being said. My cat got run over. Amen. What are you talking about, right? And, <coughs> and one time it was so bad, Pastor Sexton stopped in the middle of a sermon and said, don't say amen unless you know what you're talking about. And then he went right back to preaching. I thought, ooh, that's awful. And everybody knew who he was talking to. So don't say it unless you mean it. Don't go along with the crowd. Huh? Go along with God. Now, it said in, in, at the end of Judges that they did that which was right in their own eyes. And what had happened was is that Joshua died. Um, all of the chief people uh, of that time had died. And no one was left that had actually witnessed and experienced exactly what God had done. And here we had this new generation. And um, that it just emphasizes how, how um, important it is for us to hand the mantle, as, as to speak, to the next generation. But you don't do that just by bringing them to church. It's not enough. I've seen a lot of young people go to church their whole life. As soon as they get time at 18, 19, 20, whatever it is, they're gone. And you can't force them to accept Christ. But sometimes I believe that we don't emphasize the salvation of the young people strongly enough. And we just take for granted that that person is saved. He tells us in these word that we're to know them by their fruits. So we need to be wise and understand and be cognizant, not just of young people, but of each other. Because there could be people sitting here tonight that for their whole life they have claimed to be a Christian. And that does not make you one. There's only one way to know that you're going to heaven. And that's by placing your faith and trust in Christ, in Christ alone. Amen. Believing he is who he says he is. That he did what he said that he would do. And that he'll come back for you one day. I'm looking forward to that time. I'm over this world, right? So this is where we're at. Um, and I was going to read you some more of Judges, but we won't do that. Lord changed my mind. You say amen. You say amen to that. All right. Okay. Well, back to Ruth. We, we find here, and <clears throat> if you look down at verse number 18... It's where we get the title of the message tonight. It says that she was steadfastly minded. Steadfastly minded. Steadfast means to be courageous. Now, if you'll remember back in Joshua, the first portion of that, I'm going to turn to you. you guys don't have to. You can if you like. That is something I need to, to show you. Because I know you probably got, you have this memorized, maybe, Maybe not. So we'll look at it for just a second. This is after the death of Moses. And the Lord comes to Joshua. And he announces to him, Moses, my servant is dead. And he says, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan. Thou and all this people. unto the land which I give them, even unto the children of Israel. And then if you, if you are following along, down in verse number 6, he says, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe 
to do according to all that the law which Moses my servant commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. And so he's telling Joshua here to be courageous. And Webster tells me that courage is to be brave, bold, or daring. Let me say that again. Brave, bold, or daring. Think about that the next time that you meet someone that you know needs Christ. Think about that in the morning when you go to work and all of those people are lost. Think about that the next time you go to the grocery store or across the street to your neighbors. Wherever it is, I mean, they're everywhere. People that need to know the Lord. And we have the obligation of sharing that good news with them every time we have the opportunity. Not just once. You know, sometimes I think we go, oh, I got him oh, a couple weeks ago. I'll leave him alone. No. If you got another chance at him, go tell him again. You know? There's some guys at my job that are sick and tired of hearing it. And I'm not bragging on myself because I'm not seeing any movement. Pray for them. This world is so deep in wickedness and and, and it's been this way for so long, they don't know anything else. And they think that's all that there is, that it's normal. It's far from normal. Courage to be brave, bold, or daring. Turn with me. Uh, Gary was there for a moment this morning, but uh, back to Philippians chapter 2. Verse number five, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. We need to have the mind of Christ. When we make a decision, it should be what the Lord would do. Not what we think. Not what we prefer. Not what is convenient for us. But what the Lord has said. Now, going on with that verse, he says, which, uh, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. There's number one, putting others before you put yourself. This world is the complete opposite of that. Self is supposed to be before everybody else. But the Lord said, you're to put them first. Took, on, uh, took upon him the form of a servant. So we're to serve, not to be served. How many times do you sit on the sofa and ask your wife to bring you a drink? Now, I won't mention any names, but there's one particular person in our family that has been famous for this. I'm not going to tell you who it is. So it's you, <laughs> maybe. But we should be serving instead of asking someone to serve us. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. We need to be humble. Not proud. Not bragging about what we have done. Hey, it may be factual. But we don't need to be bragging about it. Obedient. Ooh, obedient to who? Well, obedient to the Lord. But obedient to authority that the Lord has put in your life. All authority. Whether you like it or not, whether you agree with it or not. Now, of course, you gotta, <laughs> you got to be careful there because you don't want to go against the Word of God. But we need to be obedient. Now, what we find here in the book of Ruth is that <clears throat> there is a famine going on. And famine was often a disciplinary testing of God's people in the land. We, 
We see it uh, with Abraham. We see it with Jacob. We also see it here in Ruth. Um, at the beginning of this chapter, it says that Imelech, that was, that was the leader of the family. Uh, he had decided that they were going to leave Judah and go to Moab because there was a famine. Now, what he was saying was, is that God's not able to take care of me here. I'm going to go over there. But you tell me, is God able? Can God take care of me here as well as he can take care of me there? If it seems like God's not taking care of me here, then there must be a problem. I wonder, what, is the problem with God? Absolutely not. Then the problem must be me. And I need to take care of it. So him and Naomi decided to move the family to Moab. The land flowing with milk and honey, the land of promise, the land that God himself had given his people back there in Joshua, that is what they were going to do. They were going to divide up the land and they were going to give parcels of land to every tribe. And God told them to drive out the inhabitants of the land. Not just part of them, all of them. But Israel did not do that. You go down through the list of the tribes, and it says incomplete, incomplete, incomplete. They did not fulfill their obligation to the Lord. They only went part of the way. Partial obedience is what? Is disobedience. So they disobeyed God. And God got angry. So they, they didn't do what they were supposed to do before God. And God brought <clears throat> um, a testing. Uh, they brought, he brought in these very people that he told them to drive out that started being like thorns to their sides and, and just, just uh, hurting them every time they turned around. It was something different. But in his mercy, he sent in judges that would relieve the situation for a while. But what is amazing to me, even after seeing all of this, the people still would not live for the Lord. They would keep going back to these other gods. So that's where we find ourselves with Amalek and Naomi. The, the, a land flowing with milk and honey, a land that the Lord himself had given them. The Lord who was trustworthy, the Lord who never fails us. And they said, we're going to go over to Moab. Moab, by the way, means trash heap. I'm going to go from the land of promise over here to the Franklin County landfill. Have you ever been there? I don't suggest it. You can smell it a long time before you can see it. Excuse me. There was a famine. There's some things here in this first chapter of Ruth <clears throat> that I think that, that God can use to help us in our Christian walk. And <clears throat> the first was what we found in verse number 18. It says that she was steadfastly minded. That's the way we need to be. Steadfastly minded for God. In his word. I remember when our kids were growing up, after being down at Temple, one thing that, that that place emphasized to us 
And it wasn't like they were trying to pound it into our heads. It was just there, and we were smart enough to see it. And um, was Christian education. So Julie and I decided we were going to uh, give our kids Christian education. Well, the first part of that was easy because we were right there uh, at their academy, and and the, uh, the school was giving our kids tuition because I was in college. And it's like, well, that was as easy as it ever got. They would go to school with me, drop them off. We'd all go together, right? Have lunch together. It didn't get any easier than that as the years went on. One point, we were driving over an hour to send, take them to a school that would only use the King James Bible. Because I was determined those children were not going to be taught anything other than that book. When I was sitting there in my freshman class and they enlightened me, you know, they tell you the freshmen are the smartest people in the world. Well, I was the exception to that rule. I wasn't the smartest guy in the world. I knew it. And the things that I was hearing was just, man, my mind was going crazy. But the thing that blessed me the most at the very beginning was they settled the word of God for me. If you don't know where you are with the Bible, then you're nowhere. You have to be solid with the word of God. Well, it says that she was steadfastly minded. And then it also says, then she left speaking to her. I like that. Because I've had some people do that to me. <laughs> some people call it stubbornness. I don't really look at it that way in, in all situations, but I guess you call it what you want. But if I'm stubborn for the Lord and the Lord's right, right, then I'm okay. She just quit talking to her is what she did. The whole situation with Naomi really bothers me. Naomi was supposed to know the Lord. I say suppose, I don't know, because she didn't act like it. How do you tell two young women to go back to their heathen gods? If you know Christ. How do you tell a friend at work, it's okay to live like the world and not go to church and not read a Bible, the Bible, and you profess to know Christ, there's something wrong. That's what Naomi did. We see here, the first thing that I'd like you to notice is the reason that is of Christ. And all of these things that we're, we're going to mention here tonight is something that Ruth did, not Naomi. I don't know when Ruth became a Christian. I don't know when Ruth got a hold of the truth. It's not important that I know, but you can see it in her life. It's clear. It says in, number, in verse number 14, it says, And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. She clave. Turn with me quickly, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 15. The Word of God says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Set him apart and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 
having a good conscience, that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. For it is better if the will of God be so that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It, it speaks here in verse number 16 of your good conversation. And that conversation is not the words that you're saying. It's your whole manner of life. So we're to be ready in every situation at any time to be able to present the word of God to people about Christ, about salvation, because of what the Lord has done for you. It should be easy, folks. What did Jesus do for you? Explain to them how you got saved and what the Lord has done. We try, so many of us try to be something that we're not. Just be what God has made you. Quit trying to be a preacher or a missionary. Quit trying to be some college professor. Just be simple and give the word of God to them as they need it. That's the way Jesus did. He gave it to the, to, to the children so that they could understand it. Do you think people are really impressed with you because of the words that you say? If they don't understand what Christ is all about? They don't. Ruth clave unto her, and that's what we need to do, is cleave unto the Lord. Now, we also see that it, she reproved the works of darkness in verse number 16. It says, And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Now, there's been a lot of talk over the years about mothers-in-laws and, and daughters-in-law, right? There's supposed to be this antagonistic uh, feeling between the two. And that's all a bunch of ridiculous talk. It should not be. This woman right here tells us and shows us how it really ought to be. She was loving a woman that was unlovely. When they get back to Bethlehem, Judah, the people started saying, Hey, is this Naomi? Which means pleasant. And she said, Don't call me that anymore. Call me Myra. Because I'm bitter. Well, yeah, I, I kind of figured that out. Uh, you opened your mouth and the only thing that jumped out was bitterness. No praise of God. No thankfulness for what he's doing or what he's done. You know, <clears throat> it's easy to praise God when everything is going well. But can you praise God when things go bad? Not only can you, you should. Reprove the works of, of darkness. She said, entreat me not. Look at Ephesians chapter 5. Entreat me not. Don't try to get me to go and do what I should not be doing. Ephesians chapter 5. Ruth was, was a true blessing. A lot of people, if their husband died, that would be the, it, that would be the end of that family relationship. Not her. She stayed right there with them. You do realize that's her country. Now, I don't know where her parents or her family was at, but it couldn't have been that far away. She was a Moabitess. So for Naomi to tell her to go back home, it could have been just over the hill. I don't know, but it couldn't have been that far. But Ruth loved Naomi. Now, 
And I think that is one of the signs that you're a child of God when you can love someone that is not lovely. When you can show them what Christ would do instead of what you necessarily would like to do. She reprieved the works of darkness. In Ephesians chapter 5, it says, Be ye therefore followers of God as to your children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become a saint's. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no whoremonger or unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Proving what is it acceptable unto the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that is exactly what Ruth did. She reproved the works of darkness. She reproved her mother-in-law for even mentioning the idea of going back to those heathen people and living like they did and taking back those, those idols. She says, I'm not going to do it. God is first in my life. In fact, <clears throat> you and I need to talk because there must be something wrong with you. I, I, I wish I was a fly on the wall because Ruth and Naomi had to have some talks. She loved her. Not because she was lovely. Not because she was pleasant. But because Christ loved her. She reproved the works of darkness. And then the last thing we'll see is that she was resolute in her decision to serve the Lord. These two women, now there's just two of them now, Orpah left. She took what she thought was the easy route, went back to what she really was, unfortunately. And these two were destitute. They had nothing. They had nobody to take care of them. So now they were going back to Bethlehem. And Naomi said, you know, we have a kinsman over there somewhere. A near kinsman. And um, maybe, maybe things will work out. I don't know that Ruth understood any of that. But Ruth understood this. If you read the story, and I'm sure you, un you, you remember the story, how that they went back. And what did Ruth do? She went to work. She had to work in order for them to eat. And she got out there in the fields and she gleaned the fields. And that's where Boaz saw her for the first time. He said, who is this? That's another message. We won't go there. She was uh, resolute in her decision. Look at John chapter 12 with me, please. John chapter 12 and verse 24. Jesus is um, 
speaking here, and he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall unto the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bring forth much fruit. Now, I believe that you will remember that uh, that word it is talking about the self-life. We need to die to self. We need to die to self all the time. Amen. You know, is once isn't enough. Once a day isn't enough. I don't know what the number is, but we need to be continually dying to self and giving what we have to Christ, doing his will for our life. In verse number 25, he says, And he that loveth his life shall lose it. And he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If you live for God, you're going to win. If you live for self, you're going to lose it all. Verse number 26 says, says, If any man serve me, let him follow me. Sounds like our memory verse, doesn't it? And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. If you serve the Lord, the Lord will honor you for it. And we can clearly see that in the life of Ruth. How that the Lord honored that young woman for what she did for Naomi and really for him because her life was about serving and honoring the Lord. Ruth, uh, Naomi just happened to be there. It, it, it wouldn't have mattered who it was. She would have still loved them. She would have still served the Lord. Are you like that? Is there someone in your life tonight that you're at odds with? There's a, there's a disagreement about something. And you may be right. It's not always about us being wrong. You might be right. But you have to handle it like Ruth did. With love and compassion. And you even have to go out there and really, really prove it. You know what Naomi was doing while Ruth was out in the field? sitting at the house. Eating cheese puffs. I don't know. But there goes Ruth. Early before the, the sun come up, she was out there getting her spot. So that they would have enough food And the Lord blessed her for that, her diligence, her love. When <clears throat> her and Boaz finally talked to one another, Boaz said, here, take this. And he, he gave her a whole bunch of food. Naomi was, wow, where'd this come from, right? OS. The Lord will provide. Any need that you have in your life, I can guarantee you God will provide. Amen. Now, I don't know when he'll provide. I don't know how he'll provide. But I do know God is faithful. And he will provide. 
Let's bow our heads, please. Are you steadfastly minded like Ruth? Have you got things nailed down in your life that you say, I am going to serve God no matter what? I remember when I was a young boy, my mother got mad at the church for some reason. And she tried to get me to leave. I said, no. I love my mother. And I'm sorry that she was hurt. But her response to the situation was wrong. She was not putting God first. She was putting herself first. She was like Naomi. God help us. We need to be like Ruth. Steadfast. Unmovable. As, as we find in Corinthians, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We need to be courageous. Not afraid, but brave. Doesn't the Bible tell us that the righteous are bold as a lion? Amen. That's the way we ought to be. And he saith unto them, follow me. Jesus was the bravest individual example that we've ever had. And we need to be brave. We need to be daring. Let's stand for a moment, please. Is God speaking to your heart? Is there something that you need to make a decision for Him? Maybe there's someone in your family that you need to pray for, or a friend or a co-worker. I don't know who it is, but I know the one who can take care of it. Let me ask you this. Do you know for sure that you're a child of God? No doubts. No guessing. I know that I know that I'm a child of God. And I base that on the Word of God. Not a feeling. Not an emotion. But on Him. With this uplifted hand, you say, I know, Brother Wise, that I am a child of God without a doubt. In fact, I'll raise both of my hands. I'm that sure. Praise God. Amen. I'm glad for every one of you that says that you are a child of God and that you know it. Praise the Lord. But maybe you couldn't raise your hand. Maybe you don't know for sure. You're not that rock solid about your salvation. If that's the case, then I encourage you to come to this altar and someone will take the word of God and share with you how you can know that you're a child of God. Don't leave this place without someone being able to talk with you and to pray with you and to show you from the word of God how you can know that you know. If you don't know that you are a child of God, would you look at me for just a moment? I want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you, call out your name. This is much too important.
I thank the Lord for his faithfulness and his great love and care to all of us. Our Father in heaven, we we praise you and thank you for this example that you gave us in your word of a young lady who was steadfastly minded. She understood what you expected of her and she was determined to live it. God, I pray that you would help each of us to be the same way. God, I pray that you would help us as Matthew 4.19 says, to follow you. Help us to be steadfastly minded that we're going to follow Christ. And you've guaranteed that you would make us fishers of men. We'll thank you and praise you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.